Welcome to Bench to Bedside, a weekly series of live conversations about recent advances in cancer from the research bench to treatment at the patient's bedside. I'm Dr. Roy Jensen, director of the University of Kansas Cancer Center, and with me is Dr. Kevin Alt, division director of general obstetrics and gynecology and a liaison member of the advisory committee on immunization practices for the CDC. Kansas and Missouri hold a fairly dubious distinction, which is costing people lives. Both states have among the lowest vaccination rates in the country for human papillomavirus, or HPV. But there is new research to talk about that should make all parents feel more empowered to protect their kids. We'll get to that in a moment. But first, hear what one mom and patient has to say about her HPV-related cancer. I ended up doing um, radiation, no chemotherapy. It was the worst year of my life. I had the horrible burn and then ended up, the radiation kind of blew a hole right through my jawbone under a back molar because um, the tooth died. The worst was after they pulled the tooth and I was left with exposed bone, which turned into a bone infection. And that is the most horrific thing I've ever been through in my life. I just thank my lucky stars that I'm here and um, that I get to live life cancer free and um, I get to be here for my daughter and I, I certainly don't have the energy and strength that I did before, um, but I'm here. I can't believe that it's out there, I mean that we actually have a vaccine to prevent a cancer. It's a dream come true. and why a parent would not prevent against a cancer is beyond me. HPV infection does not discriminate, but how, how common is it in the population? I think the best data from some of the people at the CDC is that about 80 or 90 percent of us are going to get an HPV infection sometime during our adult life. Um, it is a sexually transmitted infection, but it's, it's really spread by skin-to-skin -skin contact, and so it, it doesn't take intercourse to spread it. And so it's incredibly common. Most people get infected in their teens and 20s. So what types of cancers are caused by this virus? Well, there's four or five cancers. I'm a gynecologist, as you said during the introduction, so I always think of cervical cancer. Cervical cancer is about 12,000 cases a year in the United States. Uh, it's almost exclusively caused by human papillomavirus infection. There are other gynecological cancers that are much rarer, vulvar and vaginal cancer. There's a rare male cancer, penile cancer. But the cancer that's going to be number one in the next few years is the head and neck cancer, and that disproportionately affects males. Uh, anal cancer uh, is both genders. It's about equal between males and females. But the, the story is going to change in the next two or three years. Cervical cancer rates are slowly drifting down, and, and ENT, head and neck cancers, are going up, HPV-related, and so it's going to change. So there is a cancer vaccine to guard against HPV-related cancers, and new research is showing that the vaccine uh, really works. Could you tell us about that research? There's some brand new preliminary research from Finland uh, in that country was involved 10 or 15 years ago in the very beginning of the clinical trials that led to the vaccine we have now. And what they've done is link their national cancer registry to the people who got involved in the trial and have been following them for 10 or 15 years. And based on this preliminary data, there are zero head, neck, anal, HPV-related cancers, cervical cancers, and the women that got vaccinated. And so they're following about 4,000 women who are vaccinated and about 15,000 people who didn't. And so they're beginning to have HPV-related cancers in the unvaccinated group, but in the vaccinated group, the number is zero. It's a pretty amazing number. I think that's the first data we have that HPV vaccine prevents cancer, and I think it's also the first data we have that the HPV vaccine prevents head and neck cancer. 
That's amazingly effective. If you're just joining us, we're talking about HPV and why it is important to have your children vaccinated. Pauline uh, is here in the studio to take your questions. And remember to share this link with people you think might benefit from our discussion. And use the hashtag bench to bedside. Exactly how does the HPV vaccine, uh, vaccine work? It is a surface protein. It's what's on the outside of the virus. Uh, we manufacture that in a, in a factory, basically. Uh, there are multiple types of HPV. Uh, the current one that's in the United States, the second generation vaccine predicts against nine different types. Uh, if you're lucky and you get this vaccine on time when you're an 11 year old, you only need two shots. Those shots can be given a year apart. That's a relatively new recommendation. And when I've talked to our colleagues in pediatrics, they love that recommendation because they can send them for a preschool physical two years in a row and get that vaccine in. The older dosing and the dosing for people who are older than 15 when they start their series is three doses. Mm. And so, uh, and it's, it's been proven to be cause antibodies is how we think it works and, and be very effective. So exactly how effective uh, is it? Well, since this is bench to bedside, I've been involved in this research for a couple of decades. The most recent um, study that we published looked at this new version of the vaccine, and it was about 97% effective against diseases caused by the types that were in the newer version of the vaccine. We, we think we could prevent more than 90% of cervical cancers, most of the head and neck anal cancers, other cancers I mentioned are due to a specific type of HPV called HPV-16. And so there's less variety in the, in the non-cervical disease. So, um, so we're guessing more than 90% of these HPV-related cancers are going to be prevented. So who should receive the HPV vaccine? Well, there's a recommendation for young teenagers, young adolescents, 11 to 12-year-olds get a, a series of vaccines. One of them is a whooping cough. A booster. The other one is a meningococcal, a meningitis vaccine, flu vaccine, of course, is recommended universally in that age group. And then the other vaccine is the human papillomavirus vaccine. So do uh, children uh, really need to be uh, vaccinated, especially when uh, they're not sexually active yet? Well, I, I mean, I got my flu shot back in August. I don't know when you got your flu shot, but you know, and now we're here three or four months later uh, in the middle of a horrible flu season. And so we usually try to give vaccines before the exposure starts. And so certainly 11 and 12 year olds are not going to, uh, are not going to be exposed to a sexually transmitted infection. But as I said previously, 80 or 90% of them are. And so you're also lucky when you're 11 or 12 years old, not only can you get the, the two doses, you have a great immune response to those two doses and it'll probably carry you for at least a decade based on the research that we've done. So some parents have a fear that um, by providing HPV vaccine uh, to their kids, that will essentially be a green light uh, to engage in, in sexual activity. What, what do studies uh, show about that issue? There's at least eight or 10 well done studies. We did one when I still lived in Atlanta that looked at that. I, I think the short answer is there's no difference. The study we did was small and we followed women forward from, from an early age, from 11 to 12 years old, but there are larger and better done studies uh, that look at a wider age range, different countries, different cultures, but they all have a very consistent result that that's not what happens. So if you're just joining us, we're talking about HPV because 79 million Americans are infected and every year 14 million more are newly infected. The CDC says HPV is the most common sexually transmitted infection. Every year in the United States, 39,800 people will get a cancer caused by HPV. By 2020, HPV related head and neck cancers will outnumber cervical cancer cases. That is why it is important to have your children vaccinated. Pauline, uh, do we have a question from our audience yet? We do, we have one question from Lindsay Leesman who just joined the conversation. And she is asking, when will the series officially go from three shots to two? Well, it already has. For the target population that we're aiming at, the 11 year olds, uh, you can give the two series. So um, that was maybe 
about two years ago. I think it was the beginning of the year, two mm -hmm. years ago. So, um, so that's a brand new recommendation that should be implemented in family doctors, uh, offices, pediatricians' offices. So is HPV uh, vaccina vaccination safe uh, and, and effective, and are there any long-term uh, side effects that result from this vaccine? The, we've talked about the effectiveness, but the safety data is very good as well. So there's a nice study in a journal called Drug Safety done by uh, an Australian group that's been looking at this for a long time. There are 109 studies uh, that look at vaccine safety that they did in this big review article and very consistently found that HPV vaccine was safe. It wasn't related to autoimmune problems or neurological problems. January was Cervical Cancer Awareness Month, and so last year there was a lot of uh, stuff on social media and uh, in publications. Forbes magazine had a very nice publication just a week ago at the end of January. You know, there's a lot of bad information on social media that this uh, causes problems as far as autoimmune and neurological mm -hmm. diseases, and the, and the research just doesn't bear that out. Yeah. So, uh, any final uh, questions uh, from our audience? We do. We actually have three questions. Um, the first question is from Rachel. If a child missed the optimal time frame for, for receiving the vaccine, should they receive the vaccination now? How old is too old to get it? So that is a very good question, and the answer is 26. So the vaccine is approved up to age 26. Uh, you, you know, I give this vaccine pretty routinely, and that's a population that comes to see gynecologists, and so uh, we can get insurance to pay for it up to age 26, because that's been the recommendation since the vaccine's been around to, for about 10 years. The, the women and men in their 20s and late teens have to get three doses is the only bad part of that. So a question I had, Kevin, is, is do we have any idea how long the vaccine is effective for? Well, I've done a little bit of research in that, and that Finnish study, I think, is probably going to be the best data, at least a decade. So uh, I, I think the encouraging thing about that, too, is the other two vaccines I mentioned a little bit earlier, the whooping cough and the meningitis vaccine, we figured out that they were going to need boosters, you know, within about five years. Mm -hmm of uh, that, but the HPV vaccine doesn't look like it's that way. It looks like it carries forward, you know, at least 10 or 15 years. You know, we first started giving this vaccine to humans 10 or 15 years right. ago, so we don't have any data beyond that. But I think the news is good. So if you're giving it to 11-year-olds, you're getting them through the peak years that they might get infected, and then the precancerous condition, you know, I'm thinking like a gynecologist here, but the precancerous condition is late 20s and early 30s, and then cervical cancer is really a young woman's disease. The, peak age would be in the early 40s in the United States. Hmm. Any more questions, Paula? Yes, we have a few more. Um, you've already touched on the stigma associated with the vaccine. Can you lend some advice on best practices in talking with patients who have the stigma on, about why their child should be vaccinated? That is another very good question. Uh, I speak to the medical students here about this, and I, to a certain extent I said this is on us. You know, this is on uh, providers, because you really need to make it clear that you recommend this vaccine. Um, I usually tell people I gave it to my own daughters if it comes up, um, you know, and it's cancer prevention. That's really what parents relate to uh, when they're in that pre-adolescent year. There's very good research on that, and, and the women who are older who come and see me, you know, they've had friends who've had abnormal pap smears or precancerous disease, and so ca cancer is really what we need to emphasize is what it boils down to. I, I have one more question from Stacy. Uh, do I understand correctly that young adults may carry HPV without symptoms, risk, risking unknowingly spreading it to others? Absolutely. So um, of women that get HPV 16, the one I mentioned previously, that's the, that's the worst type, only about 10 or 15 percent of women are going to have an abnormal pap smear. So men, of course, are not getting pap smears, so uh, they uh, were spreading around asymptomatically all the time. Really, a very small minority of people will get a clinical disease, something that will come to the attention of a gynecologist. So Dr. Alt, do you have any uh, final thoughts for our audience before we close out? Well, I wanted to go back to that last question about the way doctors talk to patients about this. And I think, you know, since you're the director of our Cancer Institute, uh, you know, we really need to emphasize that this is a, a cancer vaccine. Tina, the woman that talked at the beginning, and I have done some programs together. Her daughters are the same age as my daughters. 
a few years ago when we saw that the vaccine rates were flattening out, we figured there would be about 57,000 more cancers in that cohort of, of a group of people, you know, like my daughters who are at the peak of their health, at mm -hmm. the peak of their abilities, but we're gonna lose tens of thousands of those young men and women to cancer that we could have prevented by raising our vaccine rates now. Thank you, Dr. Olt, and uh, thank you for watching. Uh, please join us uh, next week uh, when we're gonna have a team talking about our uh, cardio-oncology program at the KU uh, Cancer Center and how we're working to minimize the damage that chemotherapy can have on a cancer patient's uh, heart. So please join us Wednesday at 10 a.m. to learn about cardio-oncology. Thank you uh, and goodbye.